Congratulations. Your leaders in their all-knowing wisdom have just appointed you as chief nuclear director of your great country and given you the glorious task to build the first nuclear power plant here. As your country does not take kindly to failure, you should make sure you got your objectives in order. Firstly, a nuclear power plant has to work, meaning we want to power a city and not annihilate it. Second, it has to be economical. Anybody can build a working bridge given an infinite budget, but only an engineer can build a bridge that just about works. Same principle applies here. Now it has to at least somewhat be safe. You don't want to be called into your leader's office needing to explain why exactly half of the city is uninhabitable. And lastly, you want to build a reactor design that does not provoke an international diplomatic response led by your friendly neighborhood superpower. This means that no enriching of anything and no breeding of anything. If you don't know what those words mean, great, you're already getting the drift. Don't say, write or mention anything along those lines and the diplomatic complaints will stay in the hangars. Depending on your country's military strength, this step is optional. In a nuclear reactor, it's all about neutrons. Neutrons interact with the matter around us in three principal ways. Absorption, where a neutron is absorbed into a nucleus. Scattering, where it bounces off the nucleus. And most crucially, fission, or as it is called, splitting the atom. You are most interested in the last interaction, fission. This is where the energy is released. Now during fission, the atom undergoing fission usually releases extra neutrons. So hypothetically, this could form a chain reaction. One neutron splits an atom, which releases new neutrons, which again split more atoms and so on. If you want to understand how this chain reaction evolves over time, we can look at the amount of neutrons in a system and how it changes with time. If you induce on average more than one new fission, you have exponential growth. Each time an atom is split, more and more neutrons are getting released into your reactor, which in turn split more atoms, releasing more neutrons and so on. This system is called supercritical and the resulting device is, while fun to play around with, rather frowned upon by the international community. If you on average induce less than one new fission process, you get a pile of rocks in a very expensive building. This system would be subcritical, as each time new atoms are split, there are less neutrons to go around. Now if you have a system that on average induces exactly one new reaction per fission reaction, then you have a perfectly balanced system. You have achieved criticality. So, let's talk about neutron economics. When talking about neutrons in a system designed to produce and absorb them, it makes sense to talk about cycles or generations instead of a continuous mess of flying neutrons. Basically, all neutron interactions happen in discrete time intervals, like a stop-motion movie. This means we can generalize our neutron economics into one oversimplified equation. The number of neutrons in the next generation is equal to the number of neutrons now times the criticality k. Again like before, larger than 1 means more and more neutrons, less than 1 means less each time and exactly one means the number of neutrons stay the same over the generations. Now this factor k, our criticality, can be calculated by the number of neutrons generated minus the number of neutrons lost. The only process in your future reactor that generates neutrons is fission, so this would be the fission yield. It describes how many neutrons on average are generated when an atom of a given material is split. The neutrons lost are defined by absorption in a material other than the fuel and the number of neutrons that escape our system. This is a very basic view of the actual processes in a nuclear reactor, but if you would have more time, you wouldn't be watching a video on how to build this thing. Since we can increase the loss due to absorption easily by sticking random materials in our reactor that do not like to undergo fission, it makes sense to choose a material with a high fission yield. Many of the super heavy elements with an atomic number of 230 or higher have a neutron yield of roughly 2 to 4. However, most of the elements on this list are man-made and require large accelerators to even create a few grams. Since you're trying to power a city or two with your reactor, you would need a fuel that your country can produce several hundred kilograms or, more realistically, a few tons of. This sadly puts quite a constraint on choice of fuel, leaving you with thorium and uranium. While thorium does work, it is rather difficult to extract and to operate a reactor with, so let's skip that one, leaving uranium as your prime candidate. The uranium found in nature is mostly uranium-235 and uranium-238, where mostly means nearly entirely 238 and just a teeny tiny bit 235. Even though both are isotopes of the same element, they interact very differently with neutrons. For nuclear fission to occur, the incoming neutron needs to have a certain energy to split the target atom. This is called the fission threshold. You can think about it as a ball on top of a hill. It needs some force to push it slightly for it to roll down the hill. If it didn't need that force, it would already be rolling down the hill. Same for our atoms. If no input energy is required, then there's no reason why the atom wouldn't just spontaneously undergo fission by itself. This means that the neutrons emitted by the fission process need to have more energy than the fission threshold to continue this chain reaction. 
U238, however, requires a lot of energy to undergo fission, much more than the neutrons generated in our reactor. Now uranium-235, however, needs barely energy at all to undergo fission, and the neutrons it produces when it undergoes fission are much much more energetic, meaning you get some wiggle room. So great, let's just separate all the U235 from the U238 in your mined uranium and make a basically pure uranium-235 reactor fuel. This is called enrichment, and it makes a lot of superpowers very nervous. Enrichment refers to the percentage of U235 in your uranium fuel. Some enrichment is tolerable, and you can usually get away with less than 20% enrichment, also called low enriched uranium or LOI, but less than 7% is preferable, also much, much cheaper. Now, if you want to enrich more than 20%, it's called HOI, or highly enriched uranium, and people will start to pay attention. Not only is enriching uranium an invitation to get a stern talking to by some other country, it is also very expensive. But since U235 is so fission happy, you can just enrich uranium a bit, let's say 5-7% to at the very most, to avoid this diplomatic incidence. Now, you need to find an old building somewhere, get a few tons of that uranium fuel and throw it all, sorry, I mean carefully place it all, in a random corner. If you have followed these instructions exactly, you should have a pile of uranium in a random corner of an old building. Good job! What? Nobody said this stuff was easy. So why is nothing happening? Well, U-235 only emits neutrons when undergoing fission, so you need some way of starting this party. A good starting source is for example Californium-252, we had earlier in our list. Just make some and toss that bad boy onto the pile. Sorry, nuclear reactor. After a small flash, some radiation burns and a trip to the local hospital, you will notice that nothing happened. No limitless energy and no nuclear chain reaction. So what happened? Well, remember all the U-238 in our pile that can't undergo fission. While it doesn't like to undergo fission, it does like to absorb neutrons, especially the fast ones created by the fission of U-235. This is the absorption spectrum of U-238. It shows the cross-section of absorption for varying neutron energies. You can think of the cross-section as the chance that the neutron interacts with the U-238 atom. Over here, 2 million electron volt, that's about 20,000 kilometers a second, is where our neutron starts, in this so-called fast region. And if you look at the fission spectra of U-235, they are only a factor of 10 or so apart. But if you look at the difference in chance at lower energies, you can see that the chance that a neutron causes fission in U-235 is actually much, much higher than it getting absorbed in U-238. Around 235 times larger, actually. This is the so-called thermal region, so you somehow need to slow this thing down. In order to slow down the neutron, it has to interact with another particle. The scattering process transfers some of the energy of the neutron onto that target particle. The process of slowing down neutrons is called moderation, with the material that is used being called the moderator. But not all materials are good moderators, like a glass marble getting thrown against the building. If the atoms of the target material are much much larger than the neutron, most of the energy stays with the neutron and it just bounces off. This means you want the atoms in the moderator to be roughly the same size as the neutron, the smaller the better. Also, it would be beneficial if the moderator does not readily absorb the neutron, since there would just be unnecessary neutrons that are lost. This means that the best usable neutron moderators are water, heavy water and graphite. Now if you want to make the pile of rocks in your warehouse critical, you need to add a moderator. Let's use graphite as it stays where you put it and it doesn't have the tendency to flow away. So you can get yourself a couple of cases of your favorite beverage and start rearranging that pile, carefully surrounding each block of uranium with a block of graphite. Next up, turning on the reactor. Place that starting source you had on your reactor and you can see the magic happen when you measure the flux using an irradiation rig. Depending on your setup and arrangement, you will probably see a slow decay of neutron flux, meaning you have a subcritical reactor, or a slight or very fast increase in neutron flux, meaning you have a supercritical reactor, or as it's called in the professional industry, a suboptimal situation. If you find yourself in the unfortunate situation of the latter, don't worry. Remember how the neutron economics are governed in a reactor. All you have to do is increase the amount of neutrons lost. So you just find yourself a material with a very, very high neutron absorption like boron or europium and make a large rod to insert it into your reactor. Do be quick about it though. You have probably 30 seconds or so before you have a pile of molten uranium. Now if you weren't quick enough, it was nice knowing you. But hey, maybe it will be easier facing the local totally impartial judge whose house you've just irradiated, knowing that you've just created a very, very rare material called corium. If you were quick enough, congratulations, you now have a functioning reactor that you can control by moving the control rod in and out of the reactor. Now the reactor you have made is currently producing probably about half a watt, nearly 2 billion times less than the 1 gigawatt you were ordered to build, but it's a start. Increasing the power by a factor of 2 billion is surprisingly much easier than you would think. 
Since enriched uranium is quite expensive and we're gonna need a lot of it, let's just enrich our fuel to 2%. Each kilogram of your enriched uranium produces about 500 megawatt hours in total. Nearly enough to power a city of 1 million people for one hour. These 500 megawatt hours are all created in the form of heat in the fuel. Only about 5.5% of the energy is deposited in the moderator material. This means the fuel is gonna heat up and very, very quickly. If the fuel is not cooled, it can reach 2000 degrees within a few seconds. And most materials don't like that. So you need to remove the heat from the fuel and from the moderation material used in the reactor. Circulating water through your core should alleviate that issue. Now for the main issue at hand, how to figure out the core's dimension and geometric setup. To make it easier, we can make the core design radially symmetric, or at least somewhat. That way, we only have to calculate in one direction. So thinking about the neutron economics again, there are a certain number of neutrons created by each fission. Now these neutrons need to be reabsorbed into the fuel again and cause another fission reaction. Let's call this the reproduction factor. In broad terms, it gives the ratio of new neutrons to neutrons absorbed into the fuel without causing a new fission reaction. The factor is a constant for a given fuel and is not dependent on the geometry. For your fuel, it's about 1.57. Next, the newly emitted neutrons are in the fast region and need to be moderated. While the neutrons are moderated, they can be absorbed in other materials, mainly U238, and are lost. This is called the resonance escape probability. It measures how many neutrons are absorbed before they get fully moderated. As you can imagine, this factor heavily depends on the geometry, mainly the ratio of moderator to fuel the moderation ratio, R. As U238, the main absorber, is located in the fuel, more moderator material in the reactor means that more neutrons survive. Now once the neutron is moderated, has been slowed down, it needs to find another U235 atom to cause fission. We need to know the chance that a thermalized neutron interacts with a U235 atom usefully, causing fission, instead of getting absorbed. This factor is called the thermal utilization factor, and it's also dependent on the moderation ratio, R. If there is a large amount of moderator in your core, many neutrons will simply get absorbed by it before they can reach the fuel again. The product of these three factors is a very crude approximation for the criticality K. Finding the maximum in K shows that the optimal moderation ratio is about 31.2, meaning you want about 31.2 units of moderator to every one unit of fuel. Solving these equations gave you the moderation ratio, but it is a dimensionless quantity, meaning that it doesn't specify how big each unit is. As the neutrons fly through the moderator, they cover a certain distance. The distance that the average neutron requires to be thermalized is called the thermalization length. For the graphite and the water in your core, the combined thermalization length will be around 14.4 cm. So this sets your minimum moderator size. And as you just learned, the longer the atom stays in the moderator after it has been thermalized, the more likely it is to get captured. The distance that the average neutron needs to travel for this to happen is called the thermal diffusion length and it's about 14.1 centimeters. This range determines your lattice pitch. It describes the distance between each fuel section to the next one. Let's set the lattice pitch to 25 centimeters with an eight centimeter channel in the middle for the fuel and the cooling water. This hole is called the fuel channel. The resulting moderator length of about 17 centimeters is within our previously calculated spectrum. Now that we have the moderator, we can calculate what area of the eight centimeter big channel needs to be fuel in order to fulfill our moderation criteria of 31.2. Doing the math shows that an area of 19.41 cm squared needs to be filled by fuel. Since the fuel does get quite hot, it makes sense to split that area up into smaller fuel channels. Now you can't just put pure uranium fuel in there. When U235 undergoes fission, some of the daughter nuclei in the following chain can be gaseous and could escape the fuel. If these products are not contained, you would have a massive radiation leak as most of these elements are highly radioactive. Adding a cladding around your fuel would solve this issue. Zerg alloy 4 is often used here, as it barely interacts with neutrons. We can then also pressurize the cladding to ensure that none of that nasty stuff leaks out of the fuel. So, about actually building it. This is the fuel in pellet form, each about one centimeter long. Surprisingly enough, it is actually perfectly safe to place them on your desk. Since we later need to refuel the power plant, making the fuel long and thin is a good choice. In total, this fuel assembly will be about 7 meters long, with an active fuel length of about 6 meters. Now, to add the Zerg Alloy 4 coating, and finally some end caps to protect the fuel assembly. This arrangement now forms a fuel cell, moderator, fuel and cooling all in one, and you can tile it as much as you need to reach your required power output. 
To calculate that, you need to know how much thermal power each fuel cell generates. You can calculate that, or just build one and measure it. Or you can just believe me when I say that each cell will generate roughly 2 megawatt thermal. Now converting thermal energy into electrical energy usually only has an efficiency of 30%, meaning you need to generate about 3 gigawatts thermal for 1 gigawatt electrical power, making roughly 1,660 fuel cells. This would make your reactor roughly 12 meters in diameter, and adding some extra graphite around the sides to reflect any neutrons back into the reactor, let's say a meter, brings your total reactor size to 14 meters by 8 meters. Now unless you want to have a runaway reactor, you will need some control rods. As our reactor is quite reactive, making them out of boron, an incredibly powerful neutron absorber might be prudent. The control rods could also be upgraded by adding a graphite follower. This means that when the control rod is extracted, a graphite rod is pulled up. Doing this makes the control rod have a greater effect on the neutron economics as it increases the relative loss switching from graphite, a strong moderator, to boron, a very strong neutron absorber. You will need about 200 control rods spread evenly throughout your reactor to safely operate your reactor. Small historical note at this point. Do make sure you actually extend the graphite rods all the way to the bottom of the reactor, as otherwise when you insert a control rod expecting a decrease in reactivity, you would get quite a big jump. The former inhabitants of Pripyat can tell one or two stories about this. Converting some channels into starting channels, where a starter source can be inserted, let's say 12, also gives you the ability to actually turn on the reactor. Now avoiding any potential nuclear disaster, you can put the entire thing into an airtight vessel and fill it with nitrogen. Did I forget to mention that graphite burns at high temperatures? Yeah, your reactor will be running quite hot sometimes, and oxygen and graphite do not interact particularly well. That's why we need to replace the atmosphere with nitrogen. Now yes, you need pumps and heat exchangers and turbines and so on, but you can just get the local coal power plant to design those. They're not too different. Well, congratulations. You've just designed the RBMK-1000 reactor. One of the safest reactors ever built. There are other and safer reactors out there, like literally anything built after the 1970s. But since your task was to build a power plant on a rather cheap budget, otherwise they wouldn't have appointed you, an RBMK-1000 will do quite nicely.